submitted for your approval. Suspended in time and space a moment, your introduction to tonight's episode. An episode hosted by a man, descended from a long line of tough mustaches, who left behind a raft of mythologies. A cheap and undistinguished sojourn amongst his betters, Mr. Roberts is a malcontent, a clown, a hobo, a bagpiper, a belly dancer, a strange collection of question marks and improbable entities stuck together with neither logic, reason, or explanation in a place of darkness. A man who has fought a thousand battles with death and almost always won. A man, nonetheless, who made a decision. A decision to interview a creative legend. In tonight's episode, you will be subjected to a gift most humans never receive in a lifetime. An exclusive one-on-one conversation with the one, the only, Fiona Ross. Impossible? Maybe. But possible. On the Late Night Nicecast. Hello, magnificent eye drums. It's Friday, 26th of November, and we do warmly welcome you to this, the 24th edition of the Late Night's Noisecast, and a special one at that. Once again, doing what we can, and what we must, to ensure feasts of reason, flows of soul, and stolen moments of glorious creative freedom in these times of constriction. On the show tonight, we're switching formats somewhat as we turn our celebrations to the one-year anniversary of the magnificent Women in Jazz Media organization, founded by my very special guest, the prolific, to put it mildly, jazz vocalist, pianist, composer, producer, and journalist, Fiona Ross. I'm delighted to say that Fiona joins me in the bunker this evening as we meet for the first time over the traversed airwaves. But first, let's hear her in a beautiful video from her new landmark record, Red Flags and High Heels. This is your Like Poison. When will you leave me? When will I wake up without you? Just leave me alone. You're like poison. You're my last love every night. Remembering all the hurt you caused. Life told me the games you played. I never got to hear you say you're sorry. This laughing hangs around so long. I think I need a vaccine or a cure. I'm just so tired. 
Fiona Ross, as I live and breathe, how the bedeviled, begroovery and genius are you? I'm insanely excited to be here with you in the bunker. Well, I'm not in the bunker, but you're in the bunker. It's like, it's a legendary moment for me. <laughs> it's a legendary moment for the bunker. Thank you so much. It is my great excitement in the first instance, of course, to ask you what is happening in your glass. In my glass, well, I'll be honest, I'm very, very tired. And I thought about getting something fancy in your honour. And then I thought I'm always about the honesty and the truth. So I'm shattered. So I don't even have a glass. I, I have an energy drink. <laughs> it's not very classy, unlike yourself. I see the uh, I see your monster energy there. Other energy drinks are available. Um, I I I poured a, a it's either champagne or gin and tonic. I forget, but I poured it in your honor. It's a black glass, so who knows? But nevertheless, Fiona Ross, it's an absolute delight to to uh, have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you mentioned, of course, there uh, your uh, your fatigue, as it were. In the situation, uh, I am of the uh, inevitable opinion that that is no doubt part of your uh, recent efforts in regards to the London Jazz Festival and all that you've been doing these past uh, couple of weeks. Do begin, please, by telling us all about said noise adventures. Um, okay, well, yes, we had the London uh, EFG London Jazz Festival, which literally finished last night. So with uh, kind of two, well, three hats, I guess. Um, I had a gig, so as an artist, um, I had a gig on Friday night, so that was incredible with my band, and I had a, an evening where I could just kind of forget everything and just just play, which I mm. you know uh, love doing, and and it's kind of like home for me. And it was funny on that day because I was so tired. I was like, I'm just, I'm just gonna sing, I'm just gonna play, and it was wonderful. Um, but either side of that, with my women in jazz media hat on, we put on an 11 day, 11 days with 16 events. Wow. Um, all at um, Toulouse a Trek venue and we had master classes and performances and workshops and yes so it's been uh, I've been doing 20 hour days for 11 days after I finished with you I'm sure. You mentioned they of course women in jazz media and I must uh, uh, therefore jump upon that immediately please do share with our glorious viewers the uh, uh, the purpose and mission of that glorious organization. Okay, well, thank you for saying it. It is glorious. Um, and actually, it's our one year anniversary um, uh, this week, um, which is uh, kind of exciting, but also insane. I can't believe it. it's kind of been that long. But basically, I started a Facebook page um, uh, almost a year ago to support women in the jazz industry, initially writers and journalists, because I'm also a journalist. And I'm always seeing publications where, you know, there's not enough women in there. So initially I started it to kind of support female writers, but then very quickly uh, it became something much more um, uh, larger, much more significant with a bigger uh, a mission. Um, and it's really about trying to um, ensure that we have a really uh, equal and diverse jazz industry in all areas. So from behind the scenes as well as in front of the scenes. So yeah, we platform women um, and um, we have uh, journalists. So uh, it's about working with publications to get kind of more female writers, but it's not, and I always say this because sometimes, you know, when you get a group of women, people think we're all kind of like hardcore feminists that want to take over the world. Um, uh, that's not the case. Um, <laughs> we are- You, you, um, should, about you should take over the world. I mean, we could probably do it if we wanted to. <laughs> um, it's yeah. I mean, the dream is that you know the jazz industry is is beautifully equal and diverse, and that everyone has mm. you know a safe space to to just be, um, which is sadly not the case. So yeah, mm. that's our that's our purpose. Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned that sadly not being the case and obviously putting together an organization like that is inevitably born out of uh, personal experience. And otherwise, can you tell me a bit about your, uh, I guess, your upbringing through the uh, British jazz industry in particular and and the sense of uh, where you found the uh, the shortfalls? Um, well, I am um, as a jazz artist um, I was and I think it was about Four years ago, I'm, I'm genuinely losing track of time, especially since COVID. I mean, I have no idea what day, month, year. Um, I think it was about four years ago, I was contacted by um, the editor at Jazz in Europe 
and I just released my second album and he messaged me and kind of said, oh, I'd, I'd really like you to start, you know, to, to write for us. And at that point, I'd, I'd never, you know, uh, done any, any journalism or anything like that at all. Uh, and I did say to him, I said, oh, that's, you know, that, love, thank you, but that's not something I've got experience of. Um, but he said what he wanted was um, a musician's point of view, you know, rather than someone coming from necessarily an academic background or a kind of a, a, a real critical approach. He said he wanted, you know, a musician um, to kind of review some work. So I started writing for Jazz in Europe and then ended up kind of loving it. I mean, that escalated very quickly as well, mm. as, as seems to keep happening in my life. Um, but then, so as I started getting into journalism, or I realised, you know, where are the women? I couldn't, I couldn't find you know, many other women at all. Um, and then if you look at, and this is across the world, it's not by any means a, a UK thing at all. Um, but there's, yeah, there's not many um, female writers and female journalists out there at all. Mm -hmm. And then also the same with photographers. There's so many wonderful photographers. Um, I, I, I couldn't find, you know, and when I say I couldn't find, I mean, they're not platformed. If you look at your kind of the most of the jazz publications. So, um, yeah. That, that's why I mean by can't find them because they're there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just kind of exploring this and, and realised that there's a real a real shortfall there. And then I was like, well, why is that? You know, why are there not um, more women out there? Um, and that's part of our work is kind of exploring why and then also what we can do about it. So we, we've got some more female writers and kind of we've done some training sessions. And um, yeah, so my experience with them. Um, with that was, yeah, there's not many writers, but I think also as a jazz artist, I've always felt a little bit of the odd one out. In fact, my life has been a bit like that because I'm, you know, I'm <laughs> kind of not, I was gonna say not normal, but I don't know what normal is, but I think I've always been a bit, felt a bit of an outcast, but in a good way, yeah, if yeah. that makes sense. Because yeah. uh, my music, yes, it's, it's kind of comes under the heading of jazz, but quite often people don't know where to put me. You know, everyone seems to like putting people in boxes and I'm, I'm, mm. really, I'm mm. not a box kind of girl um, um so yeah so I've always had that kind of slight you know I'm not I'm not traditional jazz I'm not free jazz I'm not this I'm you know so I think that's helped me understand you know how welcoming or not welcoming the jazz industry mm. is um, and this need to put people in boxes that was probably a twisted strange answer to your question <laughs> not twisted and not strange uh, uh not normal in the best possible way because who the hell who the hell with any creativity in their in their spirit and soul, would wish to be normalized in any way, shape, or form. Uh, there is, of course, a lot to uh, explore there in a very exciting way. And uh, I, again, I can't state um, uh, enough on air here how excited I am to talk to you. I really do uh, uh, value all that you do and find you a great inspiration in terms of all that you're doing across the board. Um, Thank you. I, I have, uh, and, and I... I I have so much to uh, to delve into. Let's let's begin, I guess, in the mix of you mentioned the uh, writers and photographers in particular, and I of course see from your social media how much of a champion you are of uh, both jobs there across the board, of course, all all gender and otherwise. Um, uh, I saw on your website the uh, the mentor schemes that you have, and I was interested in uh, in how how that's been put together w with you and what kind of successes you're enjoying therein. Okay, uh, well, as I said, when I first started exploring, you know, where are the female writers? Um, I also started thinking, you know, that it's it's about supporting the existing writers, but also getting new writers, you know, um, there. And I know I only started writing because someone approached me and said, have you thought about writing? Mm -hmm. um, so I was just thinking of different ways that we could encourage women, uh, in particular in this case, um, to write. Uh, and I know many, many people that I've seen, even on social media, you, know, you can see a Facebook post and some people will write almost an essay um, as a post and it's, it's articulate, it's kind of deep and meaningful. And I'm kind of like, these people are actually, these people are writers. Um, so I, I was just starting to think of how I can kind of encourage more writers. And I thought, well, I'll start off with a mentoring scheme. Um, so I did a call out um, to, uh, for any you know, women or men, and men actually, um, if they were interested in mentoring. Um, and with our partners, because we've got quite a few publications that are our partners, so the Jazz Times, for example, you know, Kind of Jazz and Jazz Views. Mm. Um, I did a call out for mentors to see if they would be interested in, in supporting. Uh, and then also I did a call out if anybody uh, wanted any mentoring. Um, and it's brilliant because um, a lot of the publications, they've, um, 
they, they, they send me kind of advice and guidance and I put these resources together. So if anyone's interested in writing and I have to say, I'm thrilled because um, Jazz Views as an, as an example and kind of jazz actually, there's a few publications that either had no women or only had maybe one uh, women. Uh, and in particular, had no one of uh, no black writers, irrelevant of gender. Uh, and I'm thrilled that actually, in our short amount of time, we, we've already uh, changed uh, the equality balance there uh, at a couple of publications, which um, is exciting. But it's also I'm kind of like, right, okay, there's more. Then each time we achieve <laughs> something, that's just like, oh, right, okay, next step. Mm. And so I get very excited. But then it does it, it you know, it. I think it shows me that it, it doesn't take that much to actually change things. So I'm very much in all my, in all my things, not just women in jazz media, I'm an action person. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think I, I'm, I have a very kind of, um, I, I critically analyze everything. I think that comes from my dance training. When you train as a dancer, it's, it's continual uh, critical analysis and reflection, that, which is not always healthy to be fair, but I've been brought <laughs> up with this very kind of, you know, g critical mind. Mm. Um, so I'm always analyzing things, but, but I'm also having done that, right, let's do something. So yeah, I'm thrilled that we've managed to um, change some, some jazz publications balance already and so much more to come. As you say, not always healthy for the individual, but uh, uh, a fantastically important part of uh, the journey as an artist and as our viewers are no doubt already seeing that uh, drive to action in all that you're describing there uh, is in full motion. So I suppose it behoves me to dig down a little deeper into where all of that began for you in terms of your own uh, music career. Um, for example, was it in the first instance the uh, the piano or the voice that uh, first brought you to uh, uh, throw out crotchets in glorious anger? <laughs> throw out crotchets! Oh my god, I love that. Um, well, I have to. My my mum. Have you seen the film Gypsy? You know the old film Gypsy. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Or well, my mum is like the mum in that. She she was a a, a crazy stage mum who. I mean, my whole family are math, uh, were mathematicians. Um, but she was also a secret kind of performer and she always wanted to be on the stage and kind of you know, be a, a, a glorious star. And in fact, my mum and dad would travel all over the world to go and see um, different artists. And, and I remember my, my dad, I, I, this is an adult show. Um, I remember my, um, <laughs> my dad always say how thrilled he was because he, he was at the theatre once uh, and he went to the loo and he was standing doing his business beside um, Sir Laurence Olivier. And it was like that made his day. And that was, he was always like, I've, I've peed besides the Lawrence and the So, you know, they, you know they, they always were very kind of, you know, um, inspired by all the kind of Hollywood greats and, uh, and actors and actresses. So I think, you know, my mum would say to you that I, I was singing before I could even walk. You know, she would always tell that story. So from as soon as I remember, it's just what I did. You know, I was put into dance lessons and singing lessons and theatre lessons and, and all these kind of crazy things. And when I was six, um, they bought me a piano and I started kind of having proper piano lessons. Um, and then after that, um, I went to stage school at 11. So I did the whole theatre. They wanted me to be, to be a kind of musical theatre star. So a lot of my early upbringing was um, theatre based. And I, what I did, you know, kind of West End work and, and all that kind of thing. So, that, yeah, so I have to say my parents started it. So I don't know if I... If I would have, you know, if they hadn't done that, uh, if I would have kind of at some point said I want to be on the stage, because that's just literally all, all I've known. Uh, it's the first time I think we've ever been called a, an adult show. And <laughs> as such, uh, I'll, I'll take it and um, <laughs> salute, salute your optimism and um, move from the uh, <laughs> from. So Lawrence Olivier at the urinals to one of your one of your early stories, which I understand involves uh, someone called uh, Willie and the wife runs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Well, when um, uh, when I was um, uh, in my youth, because I'm really old now, um, but in my kind of teenage years, it was very much kind of getting as much experience as you possibly can. And, and my, my dad, well, fact, both my parents, but my dad was very much about getting me as much experience in a, in a wide range of things as possible. So he was always looking for kind of opportunities where, you know, singers and dancers and so on were needed. Uh, and he saw an advert in the, like, the local gazette for backing vocalists. Uh, and for some reason, he sent me off to, you know, to audition for this. Uh, and yeah, it was for a rock and roll band. 
um, called Rocking Willie and the Y Front. And interestingly, because we did we did loads of gigs, uh, and it was it was the funniest thing because it was all kind of you know um, Elvis Presley kind of it was all that you know uh, all uh, blue suede shoes all that kind mm, of material which mm. I had, literally I don't think I'd ever listened to it until that point. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, I was the backing vocalist for this band that we toured and everything called Rocking Willie and the Y Front. <laughs> It had number one written all over it. Uh, so, <laughs> so you move, uh, you move from uh, musical theatre and your parents' uh, excitement on your musical behalf through uh, through rocking Willie and his uh, his uh, respective and, and <laughs> his respective underwear into the uh, into the opening throws of your music career. Tell me uh, about the uh, uh, the aspects therein that. Uh, but are particularly fond memories for you and uh, potentially turning points that you uh, recall that uh, led to this moment? Let, oh, oh gosh, that's, that's, a, that's a large amount of things that I could no uh, say. I'll, I'll try and cut it short. I was working, I, I fell into teaching uh, and I was working in education for quite a while and, uh, and I left um, at a point where I just wasn't particularly happy with where it was going and what they were doing. Uh, and, and a couple of months after I left, uh, a friend of mine that I used to work with just said to me, oh, I take it you're doing your music now. Um, because of course, while I was teaching and I had, um, I, I had two children, uh, as I, I kind of got, I got uh, married when I was very young and had two children. And that's what kind of, I, I took a slightly different direction and moved away from the theater. Um, well, because I then ended up being a single parent as well. And there's like only so many things you can right. do as a single parent. So I took a behind Thank the you. scenes role. So I was always doing kind of session work and composing. And in fact, I meant to say to you, because I know you're a huge Dylan Thomas fan. I wrote the score for Under Milkwood for a production, like a, a community theatre production. Really? And they are, yeah, they asked me to write um, like a kind of jazz influenced uh, score for Under Milkwood. Yeah. So we, I did lots of did... things like that. We need to hear this immediately. I know, I know, I should, I, I don't, I, I was thinking this because there's loads of stuff I did years ago and I said, I wrote um, a musical, I wrote the music for a musical about female footballers and all sorts of things I did um, because I was kind of just doing as much as I could uh, whilst, you know, obviously trying to bring in money and look after my kids and, their, and everything else. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, fell into education, decided to leave and then this uh, guy said to me, um, well, I take it you're doing music now. And I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, now, now I can. You know, my kids are older now. Um, actually, now I can, I can be me. Um, so that's, and this was only, um, uh, I think, five years ago. Um, and I was right. like, okay, yes, you know, now, now I can actually do my thing. Uh, and I'd written some songs and recorded some songs. So I thought, well, you know, what? I'm just going to release that while I work on another album and kind of work out how one does this <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a jazz artist and kind of what that's all about. Uh, and it just kind of escalated from there into something quite, quite wonderful. Mm, absolutely. You mentioned, of course, the, uh, the 12 month journey of women in jazz media. I think it's about this time uh, a year ago that we first featured uh, a video of yours on the show and it's been preposterously exciting to follow your uh, your progress since then i am of course uh, uh, enamored to mention your uh, brand new record which i will uh, let you name the title of and uh, please do explain to our glorious viewers the uh, the meaning behind said title please okay my new album thank you my new album is called uh, red flags and high heels and it came out um i think about three, four weeks ago. So it is still kind of very new. Mm -hmm. And the red flags and high heels represent, uh, well, the high heels is the fun, the kind of the fierceness. I think, you know, high heels, and I, I'm really tiny, so I'm very short. So I've always worn heels. And if I, I remember when I was a teenager, um, I used to have these awful um, kind of, school, I used to call them school shoes because they were just, just nasty. Um, and I used to take <laughs> other shoes in my school bag and then as soon as I went and, you know, my mum couldn't see me, I'd change into these shoes, which were completely inappropriate for a school girl. But I've always, you know, a lot of that is because I'm so short. So I kind of, you know, like to feel lifted. Mm. Um, so um, I always wear heels. And, and it's interesting because some people, oh, sorry, my cat's just joined us. Um, some <laughs> people uh, think of high heels as something very sexy and kind of provocative. And you could go down that uh, road but also they represent strength and power and, and fierceness. So there's kind of even just high heels represents a few different things. And then, um, sorry, I'm going to move my cat. Uh, and um, 
the red flags is looking at the the emotions the the highs and the lows you know one minute everything's amazing the next minute it's not and then also with kind of covid what's that all about i i don't know is this our new world and um, so it's kind of it's it's a, a, a real reflection if you like on the highs and lows of life i assume your uh, black cat turning up there tells us that as a result of uh, fiona ross being on the noise cast the matrix is indeed broken um, yes <laughs> <laughs> within the mix of that please do tell us about your glorious band of course and i think in particular let's start to explore some of the uh, the kind of stylistic approaches you take on this record it's it's very much very much feels like a uh, one is going on a narrative journey with it and, and whilst you have those two overarching principles uh, elaborated upon by the by the title i'm fascinated to get the sense of what sort of narrative you wove through the material as you piece the tracks together um well it's quite interesting because i i mean i i always just write what's in my head i, I literally and, and i allocate time so because i think my mind is continually full of loads of things i i, I always have ideas not just about music but i just my, my head never stops really so but i'm very disciplined so i have to because of that i have to focus myself so when it comes to the album and writing I, I decide, okay, I'm going to start writing this album. I don't kind of write as it comes into my head. I kind of, if you like, store, store that up. Mm. Um, and then I decide, okay, now's the time to start working on my album. Uh, and I will sit at the piano, uh, which is there, you can't see my piano sits there. Um, and I will sit and literally kind of write whatever is in my head at the time. Um, and, and I think because because um, people have said I'm this kind of some prolific writer. I, I don't think I am at all. I think it's just because I, I kind of um, focus an amount of time to writing rather than kind of writing all the time. So I have all these different ideas. Um, and I just write what's in my head. So sometimes it will be a very reflective, like there's a song called Good Enough, which is it's a very short and sweet. It's just, you know, piano, vocal and guitar. And that is literally me, as I often feel, not good enough. Um, you know, people say, so many lovely things about me you have you have, have said lovely things about me um but I, i've never felt comfortable with that attention which is a bizarre thing to say considering what i do and especially with my theater background but um i i i i, I can always be better you know i can always do more i can always um, you know be better do better work harder so i have this continual kind of feeling that i'm just you know will i ever actually be will i ever reach the stage when i go yes do you know what <laughs> i'm good enough and i don't suppose i should or ever will because then that would be arrogance but so that's a very simple song that was literally just my thoughts at the time um but then also there's a song called um more time and again it's nothing groundbreaking it's just talking about I, I genuinely wish I had more time and, and other people I'm sure you kind of it's like oh it's this day already or it's the end of the year already so it's, it's nothing groundbreaking but that was influenced I was doing some research on the Blue Note record label so I was asked to um, be interviewed uh, for a, a radio documentary. It was quite a fancy one, actually. Uh, and of course, I was like, oh, yes, lovely. Thank you. But then I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be asked about the Blue Note record label. Do I know enough about it? I mean, I'm not a kind of expert on, on this. I know a bit. So I frantically started researching. So I bought loads of books. I was watching documentaries and films and kind of really just, but I only had a week. So I, so I had this kind of this email saying, oh, we want to record it next week. So I was panicking a bit because I mean, I was honest, um, but I didn't, I just didn't know what I was talking about. Um, but it was during that time, therefore, that I was looking at the history of jazz um, and different types of jazz with kind of looking at the blue notes of history. Mm. Um, and I found myself kind of writing more, more jazz, if you like, because I'd come in and the next song I'd be writing. So more time is very much bebop influenced. Yes. Um, and, and that for me, I was like, oh, and I could tell this stuff was going on in my head. So yeah, I just sit at the piano and, and write whatever is in my head, really. And then I go and, uh, and we rehearse it with my musicians. Mm, mm. Tell me a bit about your musicians. I understand some of them are actually former students of yours. You mentioned uh, having been uh, an educator in that regard, do share. Oh, to, honestly, I love my music. I'm so, so honored and lucky to work with the people I do. So yes, my bassist, Derek Daly, my guitarist, Yubi Bettini, and my drummer, Marty Drummond, all used to be my students. And they've been with me for quite a few years now. So they're on, uh, apart from my first album, they're on all of my albums. Um, and then I have, and I've got bigger with my albums each time. 
So I've got trumpet um, uh, and saxophone, well, saxophone. So there's kind of, it's one saxophonist, but he plays, yeah, uh, you know, alto, tenor, mm. and Barry, we call him, but his baritone is a character. We call him Barry, Barry's in the house. Um, uh, yeah, so Lauren Hignall plays uh, saxophone and Dave Burr on trumpet. Um, they're amazing. And I think the chemistry is important because for me, when I'm writing, I write with them in mind. You know, so we have that chemistry and I know it's my material. I'm very specific about what I'm writing. I'm, I like to think I'm open to ideas. And when we first rehearse it, um, you know, they will occasionally go, oh, how about this? How about that? And I, I'd like to say sometimes like, oh, yeah, let's do that. They, they may say <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm very precise, but, you know, open. But I want to find space for them to be them. So I always make sure when I'm writing, I, I work out the number of solos that it's fair. So there's an equal number of trumpet solos and an equal number of saxophone solos and guitar and so on. And that everyone has a space, mm. you know, so there will be drum solos at some point, there will be a space for um, Derek on bass. So I write very much with them in mind, but also making sure that they have space to be, to be themselves. Puts me in mind of uh, Duke Ellington's approach there in a glorious way. Oh, well, I <laughs> the pursuit the never-ending pursuit of not good enough because were it to end that would therefore be arrogance um as i say I, I think that that shines through in all that you do uh in terms of quality of work and sheer body of work and i'm uh, i'm interested in your thoughts on whether that's whether you feel that's a a necessary psychological package to bring to that situation in order to succeed with the the breadth of uh, scope and influence that you that that you've had over these years and of course with the the women in jazz media organization do you feel that 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 sense of the the mission is never over is an intrinsic part of uh, of the kind of reach that that you have yeah, well yeah i mean i think i would hate to think that i would ever really be able to go i'm amazing Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, I mean, the, the mere thought of that fills me with horror, to be honest. But, but uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's part of actually the creative mindset. If you're always trying to achieve something, but will we ever actually ever achieve it? You know, any any piece of music we write. You know, I'm sure it's the same if you if you're an author writing a book. And I, and I know when I'm writing my articles, it's like we always feel as artists in whatever that kind of creative field is that we could probably do better um you know and there's many many musicians i've uh, spoken to when they've kind of released a recording and you have to reach a point and go okay this, this is it i'm going to release it mm -hmm. you could always go back but i think that critical analysis that's part that's inbuilt in, in an artist and i think from my i've realized that when i reflect on my theater training and how that impacts on on what i do and i don't think there's a distinct difference actually between my theater training and musicians um, that that discipline that and yeah, yeah, you know this I think you know the the discipline you have in in the theatre world yeah. um, is not the same in the music world. I mean even just I don't know sound checks. <laughs> you know for me you know the curtain goes up at seven thirty or people die. You, you know I mean you're bro you're brought up <laughs> to believe that you know Absolutely, the world yeah. literally will fall apart if the curtain doesn't go up at half seven. You know and Absolutely. I and because I've been working theatre from a young age. <laughs> that's that's how I feel mm. and I'm like that with everything with timing I'm always really early rather than being late I have a a, a huge fear of being late um but of course in jazz in particular it's like well you know we'll, we'll start around day. I mean even my gig I had the other day actually <laughs> I was due to start at eight you know the doors opened at seven on at eight uh and they said to me um so do, do you want to go on at eight and I was like, well, yeah, that's what we said. Well, you can go on at half eight if you want. And it's like, I know they're, they're just being flexible. But for me, I'm like, no, <laughs> we start at eight. That's what we said. So it's this fascinating kind of difference, I think, in kind of mindsets and kind of our expectations of ourselves, mm. um, which is, yes, yeah, part of, of being a, a creative. In the, in the mix of that, there's this sense that particularly jazz musicians uh, and and I guess, like like my my joke with younger younger jazzers that I that I would end up uh, performing with was always that you know when when I when I first came on this scene, Facebook was just a sentence. There was, no, <laughs> there, was there was there was no scroll. There was no photographs. It was just Michael is <laughs> ex excited about the you know wherever it may be this evening. Um, so <laughs> uh, I think the, the the jazz scene in particular has has found the broadly has found the uh, the the horns of the social media 
dilemma particularly sharp. You are someone I consider to be a, a supreme expert in terms of how you uh, manage all of that. Would you say that comes partly out of that uh, kind of theatre discipline? And, and I'm interested in terms of what other aspects you bring to that that uh, that, it, that enable the, the success that you find therein. Oh, with social media, mm. um, what an excellent question. Um, I um, I found it very well. So when I uh, when I decided I was going to do this a few years ago, and I was exploring, okay, well, what do I need to do to actually kind of launch an album and and, and be a jazz artist? And obviously, social media was kind of hot on the agenda. And I'm not. Um, I'm actually a very private person. I, I in that I'm happy to tell anyone. So like this conversation, I would tell you anything. If we went on for hours, you you know, I, genuinely, I'm very open and transparent. But only if people ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I I don't volunteer information. So I'm natu- I'm naturally quite a private person, and and you know I would never be on social media if it wasn't for my career at mm, all. I, yeah. I'm you know it's, it's just not me. But of course I was like oh no I, I need to you know I need to be on social media. How does that work? What's the purpose of it? Um, so I kind of started, you know, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, but I, I wasn't very comfortable because I'm not, I'm not a selfie type of person. I don't, you know, I don't, I find that whole thing very uncomfortable and, um, but was trying to get my head around, okay, well, I need to do it. So how can I make this comfortable? Uh, and actually, um, there was someone, actually it was my son and he went to um, a masterclass and um, about social media and the purpose of social media. Uh, and he was telling me about this and they, and they were talking about the difference between Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and he just said to me that, you know, Twitter is just about a comment. Facebook is about reach and Instagram is about beauty. Mm. And this is what he took at, He took away from this masterclass. And I kind of that, gave that a lot of thought. And I love the fact that um, they were talking about Instagram because it's uh, image based is about beauty because then what I started to think about was, well, what do I find beautiful? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what do I see beauty in? And that very quickly led me to my musicians and all the amazing people I work with. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm happy to post pictures of everybody else, you know, (laughs) all the behind the scenes stuff. So I really got into photography and, you know, and actually, you know, I post more pictures about everyone else Mm -hmm. than I do of myself, Mm -hmm. but it's still part of me. So I think I, I was trying to find that balance of, of promoting myself and doing what I need to do. Because obviously if no one knows anything about my music, then no one's going to come and listen to it at gigs. So it's essential, you know, and I, and I think once you realize that you're like, okay, well, it makes sense. Hmm. You know, as you say, it's not the days where it was, you know, uh, you'd see it elsewhere. People go on social media. Hmm. So I tried to kind of get that business side of it, but also still be me. So when I occasionally post a selfie, I will put, you know once in a blue moon here's a selfie so I'll I'll kind of be honest about it and go you know apparently I should be posting selfies so here you go so I try and find that balance um but also comment because I had someone said to me a while ago oh you can you know you can program the tweets and do all this kind of thing and I did look at that because the problem with that is then because you have to comment you know, if someone is kind enough to make a comment on, on a tweet or a post that you put, oh, this album's great, or, or whatever the comment is, you have to comment. And I'm very hot on manners. <laughs> you, know, <and> it's, <laughs> I, I, you know, it's rude not to. So it's all very well programming stuff, but you can't program you replying. Um, so, yeah, so I had a lot, a lot of work to do with that. And, and as mm. much as it's very time consuming, I've met some incredible pe- uh, people um, through social media, like yourself. As a prime uh, example, I would not know of the bunker and the legendary uh, yourself without social media. So, yeah, uh, it, yes, it can be used for evil, but in my experience, um, <laughs> it's most it's mostly good. <laughs> <laughs> not entirely certain it isn't being used for evil, right here. Yes, <laughs> in, the, in a dark in a dark a dark bunker with a sinister Movember mustache. We've discussed the definition of. Uh, I guess, drive and purpose in that mix, mix. And then therein touched upon the definition of beauty. And one of the things I wanted to pick up on, actually, in terms of how uh, grabbing your output is on, on social media, was that sense that um, your visual aesthetic not only speaks to the the music that you bring to the world, but it also uh, elaborates upon it and uh, accentuates it in a glorious way. I was therefore interested in uh, a twofold question. What 
visual aspects in terms of potentially the film world and uh, uh, photography and art influence you? And where do they marry up with some of your uh, musical influences as such? You're asking me so many wonderful questions. I don't, I don't normally get asked questions like this. It's quite, it's wonderful. Um, I've always, I think my, my upbringing with my parents, so I grew up with watching all the Hollywood films. Um, so your Bet Davis and my and my dad and we had I remember pictures at my house. My dad was a huge uh, kind of he loved all the divas. So he loved Bet Davis, Joan Crawford, all these all these fabulous women, and also Sid Cherise. He would go on and on about Sid Cherise's legs, uh, that she had the best legs in the business. Um, but not, I mean, I was young, but I don't remember it being in an inappropriate way. Like it was a genuine kind of you know these are classy women, they're intelligent, they're fierce, you know. So it was always very much um, that about it. But I bet he was always an Ann Miller's legs, her tap dancing. He would always go on about. So I remember from an early age having this kind of like legs thing in my head that, but but that I associated that with a classy image and you know and, and that kind of old school glamour rather than anything you know slutty. Um, but I also, and again with my jazz, I love black and white photography. Uh, I love Paris, I love New York, those stereotypes of that kind of, yeah, that creative mind of kind of, you know, and I love going to Paris and going to those cafes where, you know, some of the great um, writers would, would write. I, I love that whole thing. Um, so it, it wasn't a deliberate, I, I've never had a deliberate um, thought about my image or what I'm trying to portray. I've always tried really hard to just be me. Um, and not pretend to be something else and and I think that was influenced there was an artist obviously I won't say who it was um but she was posting on Twitter and I love her music and uh, was listening to her um, and I, I went to one of her gigs uh, and she was like 30 years older than all of her images and I was quite shocked and for me I found that sad because that would you know that it, her age was irrelevant to me I loved her music I was going to see her her music but it saddened me that she obviously felt that you know she needed to represent herself in a certain way I guess to get fans and a lot of women do that so I've always been very conscious of you know I don't want that I am what I am you know I don't want to pretend to be something I'm not um, so yeah, that is just kind of come out of, you know, who I am and the things I like. So I love black and white photography. Um, so I've always, you know, I, I quite often put a filter, if I'm taking behind the scenes, I'll, I'll, you know, on my phone, I'll just put a black and white filter on. Uh, I just love the, the visual aspect of that. And I think a lot of that does go back to kind of all the films I grew up with, like Mildred Pierce and I, oh yeah, I could, so many films I could name you that from a very young age, I, I watched those. Wonderful to hear that. Uh, which which musicians in your in the kind of uh, residual self imagery of all of that do you uh, do you most associate with that time and uh, end up seeping into your musical uh, uh, creations? Oh <clears throat> well, I was always um, obsessed with Oscar Peterson, um, and although I was classically trained as a pianist, I was always very naughty and was always doing things I, I should I shouldn't do. And I don't I generally don't know how I came across Oscar Peterson. Um, but I did, um, and I bought his transcriptions. So they had, you know, the, the, the notation for his transcriptions. And I remember spending hours and hours because he had massive hands, like the biggest hands. And, and I remember just wishing that my my hands would grow, that my you know, my spread would grow, so I could play his chords. You, you know, um, so I think that my earliest kind of as a pianist mm. influence is probably Oscar Peterson. And then that very quickly. Um, as a vocalist went into kind of Billy Holiday. And I guess if you think about the visual, the photography you see of that time, then then I get that, I guess that's influenced me. But yeah, Billy Holiday, in fact, here's a little, I don't think I've ever said this, so I'll say this. Billy Holiday, when I was, and I, I think I was like 11, and I was starting to get into jazz and people going, well, you know, if you if you want to study jazz then you need to listen to, you know, all the greats, Ella Fitzgerald and, and Billy Holiday. And I was like, oh, okay. <clears throat> um, I stole a Billy Holiday tape, a cassette. <laughs> I went in, I won't say which store, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I was like, oh, Billy Holiday. And I saw this greatest hits of Billy Holiday. So I stole this cassette. And that was my first experience of Billy Holiday. I know, terrible. I'm uh, terrible. I'm a bad person. Unacceptable. We're going to have to end it there. <laughs> I think so. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Am I correct in thinking that a certain relative of uh, Mr. Oscar Peterson has had some involvement with you of late? Oh, oh, do you know what? Absolutely, yes. And, and see, this is what I mean. I, I, I don't know how it happens. I, I get to work with so many incredible people. And, and, and to be fair, this social media has a large part of this. Mm. Um, I remember seeing... Uh, and to be honest, when I saw Celine Peterson, uh, Oscar's daughter, when I saw her on Facebook, I didn't realise it was Oscar Peterson's daughter. You know, she, you know, she does all these incredible things. She, you know, she represents artists and um, puts on festivals. I, I mean, she's, she's incredible. And I actually saw this, you know, this woman, I was like, who is this incredible woman? You know, and I started looking into her and I contacted her for an interview um, uh, for, for uh, Jazz in Europe. But I didn't actually tweak that she was Oscar Peterson's daughter until I started doing more research. So, yeah, that's how I first contacted her. But, yeah, I interviewed her and, uh, yeah, we kept in touch. And she's actually a partner for women in jazz media. And there's a podcast that we do. Um, one of the women in my team, Shaney White, who is phenomenal, she um, has started a, a podcast called Knocking Down the Door, which is about platforming inspirational black women. And Celine Peterson and, in fact, Black Lives in Music are our partners on that podcast. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, Celine Peterson is amazing. And, yes, I, I'll be honest. Yeah, and I don't often say that to her because, I mean, she also, uh, she obviously promotes um, her father's work and, and obviously is a big advocate for him. But I, I'm sure she gets that a lot. But, yeah, for me, there's, there's, it's significant that I have um, that I have met and kind of a partnered with in some things with Oscar Peterson's daughter. I mean, that's just, that's just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> if you uh, if you had a room full of people uh, before you right now and you were bringing your creative artistry into the mix what are the first kind of core principles that you communicate with others through your music uh, both in terms of uh, it, its artistry in and of itself and in terms of um, I guess, words of wisdom, advice and encouragement to those coming up behind behind us, as it were. I certainly don't have any words of wisdom. <laughs> I think we're all making it up as we go along. And I think that that's what's wonderful about jazz, actually, and what I've learned more about jazz, because quite often, as I say, there's all these discussions about going into boxes and trying to fit into boxes um, and people trying to be in boxes and not to be in boxes. Um, but this is what's beautiful about jazz, because it, it represents freedom. And I think although we quite often, quite rightly, look at the legacy of jazz and, and where it came from, that's still very relevant now in that it is a safe space to be whoever you are and do whatever you want to do. And that's why, why I love being in that, that box, the jazz box, because if I want to do a bit of funk, I can. If I want to put a bit of Latin jazz in, I can. If, you know, I can put you know, all these different um, influences in there and, and really go with the flow. And I think that's probably the key thing I like to bring to the table is we can do anything as long as you've got the confidence that, you know, it could be great. It could be awful. Does it really matter? You know, at the end of the day, you're kind of just trying to be, to be you and do your thing. Fiona Ross there on exquisite and sublime form as ever. My huge gratitude to her, of course, as of course to you beautiful people out there in Dreamland for all of your support, viewership and uh, interactions across Nick Clegg's metaverse these past seven days. We're off the air next week as I take time to uh, recover from the inevitable loss of my beloved upper lip ferret. So we'll see you two weeks tonight as such. In the meantime, I'm Michael L. Roberts. Good luck. Stay legendary. And happy anniversary to the Women in Jazz Media organization. And now, for your kind consideration, this award season. Cheapened. <laughs> Undistinguished sojourn amongst his betters. Do it again. Time for a drink. A cheap and undistinguished. A cheap. Oh, 